<laughs> My name is um, Joe Hollars and I'm a PhD student at Imperial um, and the Natural History Museum. I'm supervised by Steve Brooks, who's here this evening, and uh, Dr Guy Woodward um, from Imperial. So um, I'm going to be talking about testing the efficacy of uh, river restoration. Um, this is just a brief outline, so it will do a quick introduction, gear us up for the heavy stuff, um, uh, and move on to river restoration, then monitoring, and then my project, which is on the River Great Store in Kent. So uh, is this the, the pen? It is, isn't it? Let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, no. There we go. Okay, so this is just quite a nice picture here. Um, fresh water covers less than 1% of the world's surface. Um, it's disproportionately biodiverse, so it, it has uh, 10, uh, up to 10% of all known species live in it, um, a third of all known vertebrates, and uh, half of uh, all known fish species. Um, here we have a kind of uh, little sort of pre man floodplain without the trees. So uh, we have these nice meanders. Um, these oxbow lakes, which are sort of pinched off meran um, meanders, and seasonal flooding creating sort of back swamps and mires. In England, this would be sort of quite heavily wooded with sort of shrubs and alder and willow. Um, we also have uh, the braided channel. So um, rather than the sort of uniform channels that we're used to, we'd have these side braids joining the main braid, creating islands and sort of uh, um, in, in river variation. Uh, human impacts, so we've got direct impacts and indirect impacts. Uh, damming, obviously pretty direct. Dredging. Uh, weed cutting, which is more of a sort of management practice. Um, this is sort of channelization, so the straightening of rivers and the removal of uh, meanders. Um, and also land use change in the floodplain, conversion to agriculture. And uh, pollution as well, which is more of a, can be sort of direct, so point pollution, but also diffuse pollution. Um, these work in, in concert, so we have this sort of cocktail or dirty pint of different things which are affecting the river, and it's very hard to sort of disentangle what's causing what. Many of them are antagonistic. Um, so the effect of human activities. Physical impacts, uh, we've heard a lot about these. Reduced flow, over-widening and deepening. We get quite a lot of loss of the riparian zone, especially if it's been urbanised or we're, um, we're turning it over towards agriculture. We get increased temperature from loss of the riparian zone and and um, increased depth. Uh, a general loss of habitat heterogeneity and channel complexity. So we get these U-shaped channels that we saw in um, the second lecture. Um, also increased turbidity and silt from runoff and sometimes a change in pH acidification. Uh, the ecological impacts, I've named a few here, but we've got eutrophication, so the build-up of, um, of nutrients and uh, the, the algal blooms associated with that, which break down uh, by microbes, taking out all the oxygen in the water. So we lose uh, some of our more sensitive species. Um, we also have reduced resilience within those, uh, within those rivers to disturbance <coughs> events. So as we heard earlier, drought episodes will um, have a huge impact because there'll be no refugia for, for the biota during those. Um, we also get poor recruitment as well, so the less offspring are surviving to adulthood. So we can sometimes find some big fish drifting around, but we don't see many smaller ones because they're just not surviving. Uh, a general loss of biodiversity is the key point here. And just to take off the doom and gloom, I've got some, um, some cartoons to kind of <laughs> lessen, lessen it a bit. Um, so the last 100 years has seen a huge shift in attitude towards rivers. Um, we've realised that our use of them is not uh, sustainable. Um, and uh, the ecosystem services that they provide, both provisional and regulating, are essential for human existence. Um, there's also been an increase in scientific understanding. We know how vulnerable these, these systems are and how long they take to recover. Uh, and there's also been a need to maintain and improve water quality, uh, not just for us now, but for future generations, and also to meet uh, increasing demand, growth, population growth, which has resulted in uh, greater legislation. Um, it does look quite small there, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> but despite these improvements to the water quality, we still have a failure to reach these ecological targets. We might see the chemistry is improved, but that's not actually sort of being shown mirrored in the ecology. Um, the Water Framework Directive, which we've all heard a lot about, is quite rare in the fact that it was international. It not only combined chemical metrics, but also <laughs> incorporated ecology to make those sort of river standards. Um, sadly, I think 
we're not going to reach ecologically good status in all of Europe's rivers by 2015, or we've got to get quite a move on. Um, it's also allowed for sort of more uh, local uh, plans to try and address local problems, such as these river basement management plans. Um, hence river restoration. Uh, it's a, this is sort of really a sort of 20th century phenomenon. Um, we've seen a huge surge in projects. They kind of started in America, and uh, the pure form of it, I suppose, would be aiming to restore a degraded river uh, to pre-impacted state. However, as said by uh, Palmer et al., this is sort of utopian vision is quite hard to, to realise. Um, we also have in very small here the, the virtuous circle of restoration, um, whereby... Uh, we have a self-sustaining system which is provided by a successful restoration, which is proven by effective monitoring, which increases our understanding of how these self-sustaining systems persist. And the most effective restoration combines stakeholder success, so the, the river users, the people who have probably commissioned the restoration, are happy with the outcome. We've learned something from it, and um, the ecology has, has bounced back. So I'm going to sort of focus on in-stream restoration. We've heard abstraction is a sort of... Um, there, there are other kinds of restoration. There are catchment projects that, that are sort of a, a much larger scale. But often the most efficient and effective way to do it uh, economically is to focus on the in-river. So um, we focus on just, just, just this bit here. <laughs> um, this is because, obviously, land use and urbanisation has taken up a lot of... has, has, has uh, pre prevents... Uh, that from being feasibly possible. Um, and usually these projects aim to increase biodiversity by increasing habitat, heterogeneity, complexity, uh, niche range, um, able to support uh, animals throughout the duration of their life cycle. We want to reach this ecological maximum. This just sort of emphasises how, you know, trying to do a catchment scale restoration on the Thames, you'd have probably have to flood Clapham and turn that into a marsh or something. It shouldn't be too bad. Maybe Battersea would be better. Um, <laughs> so just a few examples of in-stream restorations. I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with them. Um, these are uh, this is sort of large woody debris restoration, sort of deflectors. We're trying to increase uh, the stream variation, um, the, the flow variation. We're trying to clean gravels, create sort of uh, quiet nursery habitat areas that the, the wood in structures themselves, invertebrates can use for refugia. Um, also provide a surface area for, for, for films to develop and... Um, and grazers, and um, an important basal resource. Um, these are gravel bars, which are sort of mainly used to, uh, to, to help sort of spawning fish, fish like salmonids and bullhead that spawn in the gravel. Uh, they keep it aerated, prevent siltation, um, prevent the gravels from getting compacted and silted up. Um, on a larger scale, we, 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 there's projects that aim to sort of hard... Um, hard restorations are where we are trying to put back in those features that have been lost. So we're trying to um, put the meanders back into rivers. Um, obviously, they're hugely expensive. Um, not everyone's going to, not many landowners are going to allow you to do that to their, their meadow. Um, but maybe on the long-term scale, they, they are probably the most effective. Um, we also... There's been a lot of projects that aim to remove uh, features like weirs, which uh, reduce connectivity, um, impound waters, um, and many of them are sort of um, heirlooms of our uh, more agricultural past, so from mills and things which are redundant today. However, they are pretty aesthetic, so um, as was discussed earlier, sometimes it's, you get a lot of resistance from um, the local people because they're features that have been there for such a long time. Um, so restoration focus, this is a sort of the focus on in-stream restoration, which is uh, not Kevin Costner, fortunately, but the field of dreams, which is this idea that if you build the habitat, the creatures that are missing there, the, the, the species, will come to it. Um, and this leads me on to the next point. This isn't some rogue uh, product placement. I don't work for Strepsil or anything. Um, but there was a, a nurse at my school who used to prescribe you a Strepsil for any ailment. It was her sort of panacea. Um, and I think it's important to emphasise that Restoration isn't going to cure your problems. You have to think about um, other factors. So the hydrology. If you're putting in large woody debris, but the water, it, there's serious drought episodes, it's very limited. It's going to be a very temporary kind of... Um, it's not going to really have that much of an effect. 
Likewise, the regional species pool. There's no point in expecting species to turn up after restoration if they're not going to be if they're not there historically. Um, dispersal as well. Uh, where 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 are they, the sort of restoration sites going to be seeded from? How are the species that you want to come back going to get there? Um, the water quality itself. No amount of in-stream restoration is going to address uh, point source pollution from upriver. Um, and then also uh, the spatial resolution. Uh, are we going to focus on microhabitat? It's obviously the most feasible and economic to do. However, fish have big ranges, so maybe you should focus on the reach or even better on the catchment so you can focus on spawning sites upriver, but also um, the lowland sites. Um, and uh, monitoring is perhaps one of the most important aspects of restorations. Um, here are some girls electrofishing. Uh, forgive me, I don't know why all the pictures I've got of girls doing these kind of things, but uh, <laughs> they turned up, they, 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 I found them the fastest, I assure you. Um, <laughs> so, monitoring. We, we have biomonitoring, which is monitoring the biota, it's pretty self-explanatory, and physicochemical monitoring, which is um, all the physical parameters like depth, uh, flow, and width, and, um, and the chemical, uh, so pH uh, and nitrates and phosphorus. Etc. And when you have sort of when you monitor these together, you get the most robust characterization of your river. What's the importance of monitoring? In restoration, how do we determine a restoration project's outcome if we do not know what was there before? Um, it seems very obvious, but uh, to evaluate the project's ecological success, you should follow this M Backy design, which stands for multiple before, after, control, and impact. Whilst most people have been worrying about the Scottish referendum, I've been worrying about how I'm going to explain this diagram to you without <laughs> gathering my words. <laughs> so this was done by um, one of my colleagues, Murray, Dr. Murray Thompson. And uh, it's a, um, he analysed the restored database and the National River Restoration Inventory to see how many projects had incorporated this design. He found that 17.4% had no monitoring whatsoever. 17.4 had only monitored the restoration site after the restoration, which tells you nothing. How do you know? <laughs> I mean, it's almost completely pointless. I mean, you don't know what was there before, so it's purely qualitative. Um, likewise, impact, if you monitor it before and afterwards, gives you a better idea. But how do you know we're not, we're not just talking about annual variation here? I mean, we might even see a decrease because perhaps after a winter like, uh, like the last one, a lot of um, species might have been flushed downstream. So, um, and similarly, if you just compare uh, the restored site afterwards uh, and compare it to a control afterwards as well, how do you know that's just not local variation within the river? Then we have the more robust idea here. So we are uh, monitoring both the control site and impact site before the restoration and the control site and impact site after the restoration but we're only doing it once, so it's still subject to local variations and annual variation too. This is the most robust one, and we see that it's been done 0.2% of times, <laughs> which is uh, just a sort of, um, yeah, just to emphasise that um, it's such a growing industry. It's a multi-million pound industry. However, if we want it to advance, we just have to be able to quantify it. Um, it's not just in the, in the UK, in the 10% of projects in the US uh, have been have had any money have any kind of monitoring afterwards. Um, so this is just a, a neat little diagram um, which sort of highlights those issues. So with restoration as a science, it's so new, um, but it's not uh, advancing as fast as we would like because we just don't have the we don't have the knowledge we don't have the information about these restorations. So we need to advance our basic scientific knowledge of how restorations do work. We need to get, get operational feedback and guidance so we can understand how, good, how easy was the project to implement, what time of year did you implement, what's the life, lifetime of the project. Um, and, adapt, and this sort of allows for adaptive management so we can see a river, we can see what the stresses are, and we can design our restoration to suit that river's needs. All of this will just improve project efficiency and outcome. What do you monitor? What metrics do you use? Do you use charismatic species like trout? often done. However, what if we see no change in the trout population? But there are changes in the other fish population as well. If we haven't incorporated the other fish, we won't know that there's been a positive change on them or, or a change on them at all. So we can't be snobby about this, okay? We've got to focus on these guys too. 
Um, obviously, the invertebrates are very important. If we do see no change in the fish, um, perhaps it's because they're slower to respond to the changes. However, the invertebrates, faster life cycle, are more likely to respond faster. And they are, of course, the food source for the fish. The vegetation as well. Um, obviously, that's what feeds the invertebrates largely. So you get the idea. We want to cover all of these bases. Um, other considerations for monitoring are um, obviously the physicochemical parameters. Also, the frequency. How often do you monitor? Once a year? Probably not enough. Twice a year? Pretty good. Three times a year? It's a lot of work. You know, it gets, it goes more. You, it's all got to be quite a big compromise. Um, the time scale, how, how long after the project are you going to um, carry on monitoring? As I said before, invertebrates have a very quick turnover time. They can rebound very fast, but fish take often a lot longer, greater than five years. Uh, the sampling effort's got to stay the same. Um, if you have somebody kick sampling beforehand and they are creating a kind of tidal wave, just really going for it, and then the person who does the kick sample afterwards is a bit more kind of less enthusiastic, there's going to be a change there in the amount of vertebrates caught. So we want to standardise these methods so that they can be uh, employed by most restoration projects pretty easily um, and allow for comparisons between restoration projects in general. Um, so I'm going to move on to my, uh, my river where I'm working. Well, not mine, but uh, you get pretty attached to them. Um, <laughs> so I'm working on the River Great Store down in Kent. Um, it's lo the where, where I'm working is a place called Chillum. It's um, located between uh, Ashford and Canterbury. Um, it's quite unique in the fact that its sort of main tri uh, source tributaries um, are run over green sand and clay. Um, it's only when it sort of leaves Ashford here, here are the tributaries, where it hits the downs and gets charged by um, the aquifers there, that it starts to support trout and take on the characteristics of a chalk stream. It's quite eutrophic here, but suddenly you see this sort of gin colour coming through. Um, the main stresses for, for the river are Ashford. Um, uh, it's a growing city. We've got Ashford International, um, and that's sort of been highlighted as a main centre for, for growth in the southeast. Uh, large scale abstraction all along the river, especially where the downs are, because surprisingly, the water is better there than further upstream. Um, we've also got historic removal of, uh, of in-river features, hydromorphological features, um, and river modification, lots of empowerment, uh, extensive dredging for gravel and channelization. Um, there's also been big changes to the floodplain, such as uh, agriculture um, and also urbanization. So yeah, this is so. This was a um, 2001 report uh, showing that it, w it has been sort of targeted as a main centre for growth in the southeast. So that that pressure is only going to increase over time. A lot of the water in the summer during low flows, the high volume of it is effluent from Ashford. So that can have a really negative effect on the, um, on the biota in the river. Um, the restoration that we've chosen for it is uh, large woolly debris restoration. Um, a lot of this large woolly debris was removed historically uh, to ease navigation. Also, um, uh, as a flood, uh, for, for flood considerations. Um, but putting this uh, debris back into the river is now, um, as, as discussed earlier, a very common restoration practice. Uh, the benefits include uh, it's an ecosystem engineer. It will uh, change uh, changes the morphological and hydrolog hydraulic complexity, creates these microhabitats and these niches for a wide variety of species, um, and uh, provides refugia from predation, high flows as well. It gives the fish somewhere to lie up in the invertebrates, especially during this winter, um, the past one. And uh, it increases the surface area for biological processes, so you get these biofilms uh, building on them, which are then grazed by invertebrates, which provide food for fish. They also strain out particulate organic matter, so in many cases the river's been over-widened, so it aids the, sort of, um, embank the pinching of the river together, sedimentation, growth of macrophytes, creating these banks. Um, oh yeah, just worth saying, it's also defined as being large woolly debris is greater than one metre in length and uh, 10 centimetres in diameter. Um, so the aims of the project is obviously to increase the fish and invertebrate biodiversity by creating a range of microhabitats and niches. Um, I'm going to try and chrono sequence the response of the communities and uh, the river in general to this large woolly debris restoration and try to quantify changes to in-stream uh, processes. If we're going to monitor the invertebrates and the fish, 
we should try and get an understanding of what the effects are on production, so bottom-up growth, um, decomposition, the breakdown in the river, um, and also nitrogen cycling. Uh, this is a very simple diagram, um, just showing what the river sort of is like now and what we sort of aim for it to be. Obviously, I've over-widened it a bit, but um, yeah, it took me a long time to do that, so I, couldn't <laughs> I wasn't willing to scrap it. Um, here we can see how over-widened it is. It's very shallow. Um, it's, it's, that's that's a, a pretty dramatic fact. That's 40 meters, 40 meters across, and in more untouched uh, stretches of the river reaches, it's more like six meters across. So we really want to try and put some more <coughs> debris in there to, to, to constrict it. Um, yeah, this is me just uh, doing the measurements. So I found that for most of the river, there is less than a 10% variation in the, in the on average in the depth. Um, so this is my project design. Uh, obviously, it's not to scale. Um, <laughs> what I have here, I've got, I've got upstream. I've sort of paired the control reaches with the impact reaches. So they're separated by 100 meters. Um, and that means that the water, the water chemistry is likely to be very much the same for those, for those reaches. Um, they're separated by at least 300 meters, these, these, these paired, um, these, uh, these paired, paired reaches. Um, and yeah, not to scale, I feel about that. So the biomonitoring methods we're going to employ for it, are we're going to do algal, algae and diatoms. We're going to do invertebrates with this uh, HESS sampler. Um, and we're also going to do fish, as well as uh, habitat and vegetation. Um, we're going to be biannual sampling. So uh, I've sampled in spring this year, when the invertebrates are at their biggest, just before they hatch. Um, did the fish as well then. And uh, also going to sample them in October again, um, all of it. So it's going to be a very busy month. And the restorations will go in in November. Um, unfortunately, due to the, <laughs> unfortunately due to the, um, the sort of, I, I'm doing a PhD project, so they run for sort of three and a half years. So I'm hoping that once that's that's finished, I'll be able to carry on monitoring as well, so we can get a more um, sort of a bigger temporal scale on this project. Um, this is just the fish surveys. It's amazing what a camera will do. It makes a, he, um, I swear it wasn't that hot either. But uh, this is us measuring eels. Uh, we take the, the length and weight measurements um, and some nice wild trout there as well. And you can see our electro fishing boat there. Um, pretty arduous days, but I've managed to find a cheap source of labor, which is my brother on his uh, school holidays. <laughs> um, so this is just the results of our fish survey so far. So you can see, because of this um, eutrophic beginning, we have a really big range of fish. We've got chub, uh, lots of eel, um, gudgeon, more sort of coarse fish, lots of perch and pike, but also wild trout and bullhead. So it's a really diverse and interesting um, river to work in. And it'll be interesting to see what the, the large woolly debris does to those, um, does to those fish, fish assemblages. Uh, the Fisico chemical monitoring is being done by uh, three in river sons, which are positioned at the very top, the middle, and the lower. These are the Lamborghinis of sampling equipment. You can leave them in the river, and they will record all these parameters on a half-hour basis for up to 200 days. So that's a lot of data, and you can get we can see the difference between nighttime, dark, um, uh, yeah, diurnal var variation, um, and then we've also got nine mini dot sensors in reaches recording the temperature and dissolved oxygen at half hour intervals all the time as well. So we should be able to really nail um, these parameters. Um, process monitoring, we've got decomposition. Um, we do this by having leaf litter bags, um, some with a very fine mesh and some with a very coarse mesh. The idea here is, is that we fill them up with order leaves and we leave them in for a set period of time. And we can see by the bags that allow the shredders into them, um, we can see how much of the breakdown can be attributed to uh, the invertebrates and how much of the breakdown is due to uh, microbes, which can get through the very fine mesh. Um, just to give you an example, this is the data I've got so far, which is really encouraging because uh, we can see that for the bags with the invertebrates in, this is the percentage remaining. For both the control reaches and the impact reaches at the moment, they're roughly the same, the average. Um, and for the bags with the... Uh, with the fine mesh, the, the microbial breakdown is much less, um, but also the same between the impacts and control reaches. So perfects are 
impact and control reaches are pretty similar, which is a really good start. Um, that's the end of my, my talk. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them.